Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Um, so, one thing that you should know about your vicar is that I love baseball. Uh, and I played baseball for a really, really long time. Uh, from about the time that I was uh, four years old or so to uh, about 18, I played on, on baseball teams. Um, and in high school, I played uh, for two years on an outstanding team. The best team I've ever played on in my life. Um, I think we lost two games out of the 70 games we played a year. Uh, we beat every team uh, that we did beat uh, by, um, I think, nine runs or more. Um, and we won uh, the state tournament two years in a row, no problem. Uh, it's the best, best baseball team I've ever played on. So I was my freshman and sophomore year. And then my junior year, an interesting thing happened. We were really bad. Um, and it didn't make a lot of sense, actually, because we, uh, we just came back together as the same team. Uh, we were playing a lot of the same schools with the same players uh, on the teams. And we lost about half of our games. Uh, and we were out of the state tournament in the first round. And uh, my coaches, needless to say, were very disappointed uh, in us. And the thing that they would keep saying is that you've lost your chemistry. That was the line. You've lost your chemistry. Um, and for those of you who maybe like aren't a part of the sports world, chemistry just refers to like the spark, the kind of intangible spark that uh, a group of people or a team has that kind of sets them apart from the rest. So today, in our gospel lesson, we're going to be looking at Matthew 18, verses 15 through 20. And Jesus is going to be giving us a chemistry lesson. Um, and the purpose is he's giving us, uh, his disciples and us, something that sets us apart from, from the rest of the group. He's giving us a spark. Uh, and that spark is a teaching on reconciliation. He's teaching his disciples and he's teaching us uh, how to remain strong and vibrant as a community. Even when things get hard, even when you begin to lose, uh, even when, in this case, uh, specifically, when uh, there's sin in the community or when one person uh, sins or harms or hurts another person in the community, this is a, a teaching from Jesus on um, what it means to keep to keep that spark, to keep that chemistry among your community, uh, even, even when that happens. So if we follow those directions, uh, we learn to get along and to sharpen one another and to be strengthened as a community. Okay, so I'm just going to reread, uh, since we had a super long scripture reading this morning, I'm just going to reread uh, the portion that we're going to be studying today. Okay, so here we go. Here's Jesus' chemistry lesson. If your brother sins against you, go and show him his fault just between the two of you. If he listens to you, you have won your brother over. Uh, but if he will not listen to you, take one or two others along, so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if, he, if he refuses to listen even to the church, treat him as you would a pagan or a tax collector. So that's our study for today. Um, so to know, uh, is just, just to start, uh, to know if you qualify for this, if you know, if, to know if you qualify for this process of, of reconciliation, Jesus gives us three qualifiers right at the beginning. Okay? So these are three critical qualifiers to uh, Christian reconciliation. And here's the first one. They all come in the first verse. Make sure uh, that it is a fellow believer Make sure that it is a fellow believer. So why is this important? Why is it important that uh, it's a fellow believer? Jesus says, if your brother sins against you, if your brother sins against you, why is it important uh, that it's a brother or a sister of the Lord? Well, um, if the person that you confront does not claim the word of God as their standard, uh, you really don't have a lot of basis uh, in which to, to make your claim or your confrontation. Um, you might be able to like appeal to their conscience uh, or just, just a standard that they have in their own mind, but in fact, their standard is not uh, the standard that a brother would have or a sister in the Lord would have. You see, um, 
a brother or a sister as Christians uh, is someone who we share standards with. Uh, so all of us as people, uh, as Christians, as followers of Jesus, sub- say that we submit to his word. So anything that we see in his word, uh, we want to live by. And anything that is contrary to his word, we want to be held accountable to. Uh, and so that's how we do it. Right? So we, if, if I'm out of line, if I'm doing something that's wrong, um, I expect and hope that somebody else will come up to me and say, Hey, uh, Vicar Kyle, you're a little bit out of line in the way that you are speaking to this person. Or the way that I see you doing, doing uh, your work. I think, that, I think that maybe you're committing a sin and you're going against the word of God. Um, and I, as a believer, somebody who submits to the Word of God, am going to say, even though that's a tough pill to swallow, that's something that I want to submit to. So I'm going to say, I'm wrong. And, uh, and that's the standard. So that's why you want it to be a fellow believer. And that's, that's why Jesus' uh, process of reconciliation really works best if, uh, if it's a fellow believer. The second uh, qualifi- qualification is that you want to make sure it's actually a sin. So Jesus said, if your brother sins against you. Um, so why is this important? And I think that if you think about it, you probably can figure it out. And it's that mo- there's a lot of confrontation in churches uh, all over the world that happens over things that just aren't sins. You know, it happens over like what banners are on the wall and what color the carpet is. And... Uh, you know, who, who should be a member of the church and who shouldn't. There's all sorts of things that break out in churches, confrontations that aren't actually sins, uh, and that people, people make a huge mess out of that actually just aren't, aren't sins. They're more preferences. Um, so often there's way too much confrontation going on that's not based on sin. Uh, people we whine, we complain, and gossip over things that have more to do with personal preference uh, and personality. Uh, than with sin. And it's important that we make sure that the action uh, is in fact uh, against God's desires and not just against our preference. Uh, because one conversation or one confrontation will be motivated uh, by care uh, and concern for the brother, and the other confrontation will generally, mo- uh, generally be motivated by selfishness or, uh, or just preference. The third qualifier uh, is the last one, that we make sure that the sin is against you. The sin is against you. And this one's a little bit trickier, uh, but how do you know that a sin, that someone has sinned against you, for example? Um, I think that for a lot of, in a lot of ways it's very clear. Somebody hurts you, or lies to you, or steals from you, uh, or gossips about you, or anything like that. It's usually very obvious that the sin is against against you. But as I was reading uh, scripture this week, I was I was sort of confronted by the reality that there are actually in scripture a lot of examples of of people who confront somebody about their sin when the sin actually wasn't against them. So uh, just for example, take David and Nathan. You guys remember the story of David and Bathsheba, right? So David sinned against both Bathsheba and her husband Uriah by sleeping with Bathsheba. And then he tried to cover it up by having Uriah killed. Uh, And then he lied about it. And on and on were all of these sins. Now, who do you think was the person to bring up uh, the sin to David? It wasn't Bathsheba. It was actually Nathan. The prophet Nathan was the one who brought up the sin to him. So uh, basically, the point is that we want to make sure that the sin is in fact against us. But it's important to recognize as well that if there is a brother or sister in your community that is struggling uh, with sin, that you, and nobody's bringing it up to them, that you bring it up. So, uh, for example, like if, if someone is uh, stealing or lying or whatever other simple thing that we do, even if it's not against you, you should probably go and show him his fault. Not only will it strengthen the church to do so, uh, but like our reading said, if Jesus cared about the one lost sheep out of the hundred, uh, then we should probably care about that too. 
Uh, so it's, it's important to, to bring up those sort of things within our community, um, even if they aren't specifically against us, because it strengthens our whole community and it weakens the whole church uh, if, if we don't bring it up. So, from there, uh, Jesus goes on to, uh, after the qualifiers, to make sure that the person's a fellow believer, to make sure it's actually a sin, to make sure it's against you. Jesus goes on to teach his disciples how uh, you go about winning your brother back uh, from, from sin and from any sort of conflict. The first step is this, that you don't make it a public matter or a topic of gossip. Uh, but you speak to the person one-on-one. -on -one. So the purpose of all of the next four steps are to win your brother back. And that's the purpose here, too, is to win your brother over. That means uh, when, when, you're, when we're saying win your brother over, you're trying to convince uh, the, your fellow believer to trust in the Lord again and to admit fault. Um, so perhaps uh, the greatest challenge for us in this situation is the specific directions to make it a matter that's one-on-one. -on -one. Far too often between the time that the sin happens uh, and going to show someone his fault, uh, we have a conversation with others that begins like this. You wouldn't believe what so-and-so did. Or, uh, if we want to spiritualize it, we might say something like this. Pray for me. I have to go talk to so-and-so about so-and-so or whatever he did. Um, and it's just kind of a, uh, a simple but oftentimes deceiving way of talking about somebody else's, uh, somebody else's sins and somebody else's problems. So the reason that we don't, uh, I think, generally talk one-on-one -on -one to people is either we don't care enough to bring the problem up at all, or two, um, we don't do it because we're bothered, but maybe we feel awkward about bringing up a problem or a conflict that happened uh, between one person or the other. Um, but I think most of the time, uh, when we do that sort of thing, we often want to build ourselves up uh, in our own eyes or in somebody else's eyes as well. But the problem is, is that uh, it won't do anything to win your brother over to do this. Uh, it won't do anything to, to, help, uh, to help him confess or trust in the Lord again. Uh, it will most likely just erode their confidence in you as a messenger and a friend. So Jesus tells us specifically, uh, when there is a state of conflict, go and lovingly show your brother or sister their fault. Just between the two of you. Just have a conversation between, uh, between the two of you before you do anything else. Step two, uh, the thing that he says, is to bring in the help of two or three others, uh, other believers. To bring in the help of two or three other believers. If, uh, if there is conflict, and if you've gone to the person one-on-one -on -one and the person hasn't listened. Um, so just to, just to clarify, this is actually not, the next two steps, in fact, are not uh, getting a posse. And or a gang of people together to go and coerce or force somebody in to submission or force somebody in to repenting. Uh, that's not the way that Jesus works and it's not the way the Christian community works. Uh, the point of this, again, is to restore the brother, to win your brother over. Uh, and it's also for there to be accountability uh, when there's conflict. So you bring two or three others in so that they can listen to the conversation, so that they can hear how things are going, so that they can uh, reinforce the words that are being said uh, and encourage the person to see uh, what they're doing as wrong or hurtful to themselves or others, and also um, to believe again and trust in the Lord. I don't know if you guys have ever seen the television show uh, Intervention. Is that, is that a common show on here? It was on for a while. And the show goes like this. Uh, the show's surrounded by a, uh, a one individual who is struggling with any sort of addiction. And it's called the intervention because it just videotapes the process uh, of a family meeting with this person in their family who struggles with addiction and sitting down and telling them, uh, one, that they're loved by, uh, by the people, by the family. And then two, uh, that the thing that they're doing is enslaving them. 
Um, and then three, that they want to see the person free from it. So you get this whole family sitting around and telling this person how much they love and care for them and how much they want to see them healed and reconciled with the Lord. It's really a pretty beautiful show in a lot of ways. Um, but that's how I think this is supposed to work, both steps two and three, is that we're supposed to bring others into the conversation to encourage somebody to be reconciled to the Lord and reconcile uh, back to the individual that they've seen. The third step, um, the third step, if this doesn't work, or if, uh, if the person uh, doesn't, doesn't uh, repent or doesn't believe, uh, is to bring in the help of the church. There are uh, specific people in the church, pastors, leaders, uh, who are trained to deal with the problems of uh, unrepentance and stubbornness, to help and counsel um, and so, in order for that to happen, oftentimes uh, the church or individuals in the church will bring somebody and just say, hey, you know, I know this person is struggling with this, or there's conflict between me and this person, and we just need help, you know. Uh, and that's been an effective tool for many, many people uh, in, in resolving conflicts amongst themselves. So, like, let's be honest, we all know what it's like for sin and stubbornness to spiral, I uh, am, am generally, I would say, a stubborn person, especially when somebody brings up a fault against me. Uh, I don't know if any of you have this sort of situation that happens in your life, but I remember my mother uh, used to, when I would be doing something wrong, right, and she would and she would bring it up to me, or my dad would bring it up to me. My first reaction would always be uh, to not say anything. Look, find a spot in the distance uh, where I didn't have to look at either of them and just block out their words. And so my mom would say, you know, uh, Kyle, I realized that since the three or four calls that I've gotten, that you are not doing very well in school at all. Uh, and my eyes would just glaze over and look into the distance and not listen. And then the more that she brought it up to me, the more that that would happen, the more stubbornness that would, I would get in my heart, and the further away I would get, she'd bring my dad, uh, and then they'd both sit down and say, like, you know, I don't know is not an answer for a test. <laughs> and, um, and I would continue to stare. And it took a long time for them to break through some of the stubbornness of my own heart to be able to be reconciled and say, hey, you know what, the fact of the matter is, I'm wrong. And I need to change the things that I'm doing. I need to like retrust the Lord's forgiveness and and uh, and change what I'm doing. And I think that that's a similar thing that happens in the church often too. We shouldn't be surprised. But we have uh, people in our community that are specifically uh, specifically designed and trained to be able to work through some of those things uh, and work through some of that stubbornness that we all feel uh, because. We can get to a point, if we don't recognize that, uh, where we become more, and you should listen to this, this is, I think this is a good way of thinking about belief and unbelief, is when we become more comfortable with our sin than we are with our Savior, that's unbelief. When we trust more in the comfort of our own sin uh, that we know than we are with the Savior Jesus, that's unbelief. And when we come to that place, we really need help. Uh, and when there's stubbornness, even in that place, Jesus says, uh, if there's continued stubbornness, if there's continued uh, hardness of heart, we have to treat them as an unbeliever. Because this is the fundamental difference between a believer and an unbeliever. A believer is more comfortable with their Savior than they are with their sin. And that's why Jesus instructs them uh, to treat them as an unbeliever. So how do we treat unbelievers? That's, a, that's the big question of this text. How do we treat unbelievers? Well, we invite them again to know their Savior and to repent and trust, them, trust Him. We also pray for them and continue to share the Gospel with them. We don't kick them out. We don't, we don't, say, uh, we don't say, we don't like you anymore. We don't want to touch you anymore. We don't want to see you anymore. We don't want to talk to you anymore. Um, we just continue to invite them to, to know their Savior and to repent and trust Him. But ultimately, but ultimately, the individual uh, is no longer a brother because they no longer share in the, the belief that Jesus is their Savior. So that's Jesus' chemistry lesson. Uh, and he desires us to be a community that sharpens 
one another by continually talking through uh, our sin, our brokenness, the ways that we've hurt one another. Uh, he continues, uh, he encourages us to, us to continue to sharpen one another and not let sin stand between us and the fellow believer. So there's two final uh, observations that I want to make about this whole process that, uh, that Jesus gives to us. Um, and I'm going to take, they're out of order, I'm going to take the second one first and then the, the first one second. So the first one is uh, humility. Humility is the key to reconciliation. Because let me ask you this question. Uh, do you feel as though you can cast any such stones and, uh, and call anybody else to account for their sin when you know that you're sinful too? And are you completely comfortable with somebody else confronting you with your sin? I would say no. I mean, just from my own personal experience and my own personal heart, is that's a hard thing to do. It's a hard thing to talk to somebody about the sin uh, that's in their life. And it's an even harder thing for somebody to talk to you about the sin that's in your life and for you to be receptive to it. Um, but this is uh, the essence of what we're called to do as Christians. Uh, and the problem is, is that we're often too afraid to come to terms with our own sin for us to be able to hold another person accountable. And the way that you break through that is through humility. Uh, I often cringe when I hear parents uh, say something like this. I can't tell my son or daughter not to blank because I did it. I'll look like a hypocrite to them. You know, I can't tell my son or daughter not to, um, not to like, gamble or cheat or steal or, or drink or have premarital sex or whatever. Because I did. So how am I supposed to tell my, my son or daughter that, that they can't do that? I often cringe when I hear that because that's not the point. The point is for you to say it and then when they say, well, you did that. You know, why, why should I not when you did it? The response is not, well, I don't know, I must, I must be a hypocrite. The response is, you're right. I was wrong. And I don't want you to be in the same trap either. We don't need to be afraid to confront our own sins when we're confronting somebody else, because that's often what happens. You think about just the general defensiveness uh, of people when you confront them. It's often like, you know, if I'm confronting you uh, with your sin, oftentimes the natural knee-jerk reaction is to say, well, who are you? Who are you? I know you. And you're not that great either. You're a sinner too. And the point is that you say, yeah, I am. I recognize that. Uh, and I trust in my Savior. And I just want to make sure that you trust your Savior with your sin as well. It's the same thing that happens uh, with husbands and wives. Oftentimes, we just go years and years without ever addressing the sin in a spouse because we think that we'll have to address the sin in our lives too. And you probably will. But that's not a bad thing. So the, the key to all of this is to acknowledge our own sin and have humility uh, to, say, to say that I'm not the greatest either. Do you remember the conversation that started this whole process of reconciliation in Matthew 18.1? The disciples asked Jesus, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus said, the one who becomes like a little child, the one who becomes humble is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And that's the same thing uh, when we bring up sins to one another. Is that we have to come to one another in humility. And the final, uh, the final point that I want to make uh, is that, and I made it in the beginning, um, is that reconciliation is the spark of the church. This is the thing that makes our community strong, makes our relationships strong, makes uh, just who we are strong. Uh, when we say iron sharpens iron, the scripture says that. This is what it means. It means to call one another out, to continue to refine one another, one another and challenge one another to walk closer and closer with the Lord um, and to not be afraid to have our sins shown um, because that just means they're real. And that just makes our Savior real as well. It means that we trust in Jesus even more uh, when, when we know that we don't have the ability to make it on our own, and we don't have the ability to, uh, to be perfect. So we have to trust in the Lord.
So that was the problem like, generally with my baseball team. All our coaches would say, you know, you guys have lost the spark. You guys have lost the chemistry. But we, what we had actually lost was humility. We had actually lost the ability to say, man, we're, we're just not that good. Everybody on the team thought that they were really good. And we looked back at our past and we said, man, we were so awesome. We're still awesome. We've got, we've got the ability to be awesome. We've got the ability to win all our games, to win the state championship. We said that all the way through, through the year. But we didn't. Because we were bad. And we lost a lot. And we had to come to a place where we were actually saying that we weren't that good instead of saying that we were really good. Um, so instead, uh, we're, we're the same way. And I think if Matthew 18 tells us uh, tells us anything. It tells us that we desperately need Jesus, His forgiveness, um, His reconciliation, and we also desperately need one another to remind that, uh, to remind ourselves of that as well. I just encourage you, uh, just one last note, that if if you do have a sin or distance between you and a fellow believer, I would, I would just encourage you to bring that up. Whether it's calling the person on the phone after church today or talking to, to them one-on-one uh, you know, in, in your neighborhood or wherever. Uh, if you have a conflict with a fellow believer, bring it up. And also, if you feel far from the Lord, recognize uh, that He too wants to be reconciled to you. Right? And Hebrews 2.11 calls Jesus our brother. Uh, and says, the one, says that he is the one who humbly came to show us our fault and sin. Right? And to restore us to our Father in heaven. Uh, and to one another here on earth. So let's just do the same uh, for one another as we live out our lives as a community. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we recognize that the sin and brokenness that separates us from you... Um, no longer has to stand because Jesus, uh, your Son, has reconciled us back to the Father. And we pray as St. Paul prayed and implored all of us uh, to be reconciled to you and to be reconciled to one another. Um, We pray that we would just hold tightly to that as a church. No other community, God, uh, is like that in the world that continues to be be reconciled, uh, continues to seek forgiveness uh, for sins and problems and continues to stick together even through thick and thin. Um, We know that you have given us your spirit and you have given us the spirit of reconciliation to share with one another in this church. And we pray that we would do that. Uh, In your son's name, that reconciles us all. Amen.